How Internet Travels Across Oceans The vast majority of internet data is carried over a subterranean network of undersea cables, from this video to your Pokemon Go account to WhatsApp groups. What is the point of caring? In today's society, those slinky sub-aquatic lines are becoming increasingly important. What are their futures? How do they work and how often do they get attacked by sharks? As told by the authoritative submarine, today we delve into the deepest recesses of the internet's journey through the ocean. Subsea internet cables are crisscrossing the globe. Currently, 493 are operational or under construction. There are a variety of wires spanning from the relatively short 300km cable that runs between Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan to the massive 6,600km cable that runs beneath the Black Sea. Virginia Beach in the United States and Bilbao in northern Spain are linked through the Maria Cable. A blue whale's weight is equal to 24. It appears that the company is building serpentine superhighways around the world. There are already 1.5 million kilometers of undersea data connections, and experts are speculating on how much it will all cost. However, professional estimates suggest that a typical transoceanic cable will cost between $300 million and $400 million. They are not particularly thick, often around the girth of a garden hose, so it appears like a lot. Several layers of protective thixotropic jelly are wrapped around the fiber optic core. Many plastic sheaths and copper wires are used to power the device. Nonetheless, they can transport an incredible 100 gigabytes per second on average. Current and upcoming lines capable of transmitting 400 terabytes per second in data. So, how does so much information fit into such few channels? Dense Wavelength Division Multiplexing, a highly advanced data wrangling technology, is one aspect of the solution. To put it another way, Dense Wavelength Division Multiplexing allows data providers to employ various wavelengths of light. Instead of using a single wavelength to transmit data, many wavelengths are used simultaneously and layered to achieve incredible data speeds. This occurs at both ends of the wire at buzzing data center-like landing locations. These cables consist simply of long, straight lines set at a distance of between 70 and 100 kilometers. A series of repeaters are inserted every few kilometers into the seabed cables. The signal strength remains constant over long distances because of these amplifiers. Due to this, to power the repeaters, copper conductors are included in the cables, which can transport up to 10,000 volts DC. How come the cables are late? They're wrapped into huge cylindrical drums on specialist cable laying ships, which take a year to plan and charting will go into determining the best transoceanic route and avoiding problematic underwater cable placements. Include areas that are volcanic, earthquake prone, or prone to mudslides, as well as areas that are extensively trolled by fishermen. The cable is spooled out the back of a ship at a leisurely 10 kilometers per hour. If the ship experiences bad weather for more than an hour, the captain can decide whether to cut the chain, tie it to a lad, and retire to calmer seas. When the storm subsides, the ship returns to the buoy and resumes its journey without incident. Cable outages can and do happen. For example, in 2012, Hurricane Sandy in the United States knocked out several important transatlantic cables, affecting networks for hours. A huge portion of these interruptions was caused by the Fukushima earthquake in Japan in 2011. Human recklessness, on the other hand, leads to trawler nets and stray ships anchor cables. Closer to the shore, the likelihood of such a disturbance is substantially higher. As a result, the closer the lander cable is to the seabed, the more probable it will be carefully armor-plated. Long, dedicated trenches were dug with ship-drawn plows. An undersea cable belonging to Google has been chewed on by sharks, which is wonderful. You can devour this 2014 clip for more ominous reasons than that, as the US government has warned about hostile foreign interference like Russia and China. 
The U.S. government should be aware of all that Edward Snowden, a whistleblower, revealed in 2013. The NSA had no reservations about listening in on fiber optic conversations. Underwater cables also attracted interest last year due to their geographical implications. Huawei, a Chinese technology giant, was stopped from laying cable between Australia and the Solomon Isles after opposition from the Australian government. China is concerned that the link could be used to obtain access to Australia's sensitive internal networks. What is the ownership of these cables? What a great question! Governments or quasi-national telecommunications companies have traditionally footed the bill since it's such a costly business. As the biggest cable owner in the world, Americans own 230,000 kilometers of underwater cable. In terms of ownership, China Telecom ranks second. Cables are typically owned by large groups of companies or a consortia of up to 50 companies. The technology industry, government agencies, and other organizations are all involved despite the fact that it helps to spread the cost initially, it is less beneficial if anything goes wrong and no one is able to agree who wears a wetsuit. There is a need for action. It is becoming clear to big tech companies that their potential expansion is limited by underwater cable networks. Consequently, corporations like Facebook, which owns approximately 100,000 kilometers of submarine cables, have accounted for much of the investment in underwater cable infrastructure in recent years. There is a large private network owned by Amazon, which is almost as large as the one owned by Google. AWS data centers are connected to the internet giant's mighty data centers by cables crossing the oceans and seas as well as the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, and the South China Sea.